So you want to be a picture book writer, then you got to write picture books. And you're going to need a bucket load of bright ideas for titles, plots, and hooks. If you're partial to prose or you're raring to rhyme, then repeat after me. It's a challenge, but I'm going to tackle each story one month at a time with 12 by 12. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our I Can't Believe It's July already <laughs> webinar. Today is very exciting because once again, we get one of our very own as a our speaker today, Valerie Bowling, who I like to think of as having come on to the kidlit space like a me. Her debut book, Let's Dance, released in 2020, and it won the Crystal Kite Award and was a Connecticut Book Award finalist. Her most recent book, Together We Ride, just came out a few months ago, a couple months ago, and she has Ride, Roll, Fun, Time, Ride, Roll, Run, Time for Fun coming soon. Her books are full of movement and joy and diversity and just celebrate the simple things in life that are really the most special things in life, I think. And she, Valerie, has also been an educator for up to 30 years, I believe. And now she is an instructional coach for educators, implementing a variety of instructional strategies designed to increase student performance. So she's dynamite at presentations, and getting kids excited about reading and knowing what they love about books. She is a graduate of Tufts University as well as the Teachers College of Columbia University. So I always love it when we get educators who are also picture book writers because I think they have a very unique perspective on what makes a book work for kids and particularly what makes a book work in a classroom. And if any of you caught Valerie's book chat, she was our debut 12 by 12 book chat speaker back in February, you learned an awful lot about the process that she went through with her first book and getting her agent and how things just took off for her from there. And she's a joy to listen to. Today, she'll be talking about building tension in picture books, which is so important. And I think something that we often don't focus on enough because we're trying to line everything up to get from the beginning to the end. And yet we have to keep that interest, keep the pages turning throughout that, throughout that book, throughout that process in order for it to be successful and in order for the kids to want to keep turning the pages. So without further ado, Valerie, please join us. As you all probably know by now, I will be coming off camera while Valerie presents and then I'll come back on to moderate the Q&A. Valerie has always been extremely giving to our community. I should mention as well that she is on our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee and one of the heads of the Black Affinity Group. Lots going on there. <laughs> always a lot going on, but it's important to give back. And that's why I wanted to offer that. 12 by 12 is such a wonderful community. So I am so happy to be here with all of you. And Julie gave me such a wonderful introduction. And the part I was going to add about 12 by 12, this is my third year in 12 by 12. And I'm so happy to be a member of this community and plan to continue being a member of this community. And as Julie has already told you, I'm on the DEI committee and I co-moderate the Black Affinity Group with Rona Sheardon. So I just wanted to share a bit more about my 12 by 12 connection. I am joining you from Connecticut, which is the home of the indigenous Silinois people. And so I wanted to recognize the land that I'm on. And I wanted to also let you know that I think you saw in the description 
that this will be interactive. That's the educator part of me that I want. There will be some times where I'll ask you questions and have you respond in the chat. And there'll be a few minutes where you will also be able to turn to a manuscript and practice some of the strategies because I think there's nothing as valuable as learning something new or being reminded of some things you already know and then immediately having the chance to apply. I think that's when learning, learning can have the greatest impact. And I wanted to say a little bit about how I became interested in this topic. And that is because quite frankly, this is something I still struggle with in my own writing. Those of you who have read Let's Dance, that's more of a concept book, though I will talk about how there is some tension in there in places. And also with Together We Ride, there's a very short arc where there's tension, but in my longer works, which haven't been published yet, it's something as I bring them to critique group that I can notice it in others' stories and I notice it in mine too, but it's something I continue to work on. So I just want to be really transparent about that. And I want to also give a shout out to a number of Karen Boss. I love this picture of her. That's who Karen is. And she's an editor at Charles Bridge. And there's something called verbal credit. And I have seen her give a presentation as well about tension. And at least one of my slides, and I'll point it out when I get there, is from her presentation. So I want to give that credit to her. And also just, I think, inevitably some of the things that perhaps I've learned or that I will share, some have been inspired by her. There's a lot that's just new from my own experience, but I did want to give a shout out to Karen. So I'm going to start out because I know in true 12 by 12 fashion, one of the things people like to know a bit about is the person who's actually presenting. So I figured I would tell you a little bit about myself in a different sort of way. And so I'll talk about my tension-filled publication journey. So the first thing that happened was, as many people do, I began to query too early. So I had sent out Let's Dance at the beginning of 2018. And I had written it in the first draft in June of 2017. And then I got some feedback from a friend. I wasn't yet a member of a critique group, but I got great feedback from someone who is a storyteller, published author herself now of picture books. And she also is a retired librarian. So she knows a lot about books. And I took her advice and then I made some revisions later that year, started querying in January of 2018. I had an agent who was interested in February. So you're thinking, oh my gosh, a month, this is incredible. It was, but when she asked for more work, I sent her two other manuscripts. They weren't as polished. I didn't know about a submission package. I didn't know that if you're querying an agent that you should have other manuscripts that are polished. So as a result, it ended up being a no. So there was this, wow, someone's interested. And then there was a no. And then eventually that book did get picked up in a Twitter pitch by an editor that June. But I published that book without an agent. So that's tension filled because you're wondering if you're making the right decisions and you're reaching out to different people and friends who are published at CBWI, the Authors Guild, to get some advice on the contract. And ultimately, I ended up sending out 150 queries before finding an agent. And I connected with my agent, James McGowan, actually three months after Let's Dance was out. So you can see already there were ups and downs, and I did not have a traditional path. And then Let's Dance was released during a pandemic. The book was released March 3rd. Fortunately, I was able to have an incredible launch event. Over 200 people attended at our local library. That was Saturday, March 7th. 
And then the following Wednesday, March 11th, we got a phone call that night saying, you will not be returning to school. So a lot of the events and things that I had set up came to a halt. There were some virtual events I was able to do. Some bookstores were pivoting to that, a couple of libraries, but not everyone. And obviously no school visits. And then presenting to 12 by 12 members because so much already and you expect only the best. So I'm feeling as even though I do presentations all the time, I'm feeling a little unsettled, which it's good to feel a little unsettled. And part of it, as I said, is because of the topic. It's something I'm still working on and also knowing this audience. So I appreciate you tuning in to this and I hope that you will gain some information that you find helpful. So to start out the first interactive bit, if you would share in the chat why tension is important in a picture book. If you just want to write some thoughts, I'd like to look through the chat and see what you're thinking. Yeah, I'm seeing keeps up interest, keeps you turning the pages, builds relatable characters, invests us in the character's journey makes the reader, the reader want to keep going because the reader is engaged. All of these things, a lot of page turning things. Absolutely. It makes the reader care, keeps kids on their toes. So thank you for all of you who have shared wonder or awe, excuse me, and character connection. So yes, hooks you into the story. So sparks emotions. We'll talk about emotions as well. So everything you've said is great. And there is a quote from Ann Whitford's Paul's, Ann Whitford Paul's book, writing picture books. And she says, no tension means bored readers and worse yet, rejection from an editor. So again, if you are hoping to be published and we know sometimes getting that news about the quiet story can be the kiss of death. That's why we want to make sure that for the most part, there's tension in our stories. Now, there are some stories where maybe it's not there. I don't mean to ever make a blanket statement about something, but we do know particularly for debut authors, often there are certain form, there's a certain formula or characteristics that agents and editors are looking for. That's just reality. And I also want to say that tension isn't just about conflict or a big problem. It's about pulling the reader along, as you all have said, and keeping the reader engaged and interested in what's happening. So it doesn't always have to be something big. And in some of the examples that I'll share later, you will see examples of that. So one of the things I like to do is I think about an image. I like to think about, I find that when you have an image that can help you just stay focused in your writing. I know I also do a presentation on revision and maybe I'll get to come back and do that next year. I know last year we had Rajni LaRocca did a presentation on revision. So maybe next year there'll be room for another revision presentation. And in that I have a slide of puzzle pieces because I look at revision as putting the pieces of a puzzle together. So for tension, I think of tug of war. I think of this pull, slip, you get pulled forward and even yanked. And this constant pulling is what keeps the reader interested. That's what we're talking about and wondering, is the character going to win or achieve her, his, or their goal. How is the problem going to be resolved? So if you can think of maybe this tug of war image will help you. And if not, try to come up with your own image. If we had more time, I would actually even have you think of some images of tension, but we're going to move along because I have a, a lot of information to share. And I want to be sure we have enough time for your questions at the end.
So I do want to do this interactive bit and I'd like for you to think about favorite books you've maybe written yourself or that you've read. And what do you love about these books and do they have tension? So if you could share some of that in the chat, I'd appreciate seeing it. Oh yes, this is not my hat. That's a good one. Ah, no bunnies here, where the wild things are. Monster at the up wire wings, Maxwell's magic mix up, Sam and Dave dig a hole. Wow, yeah. The enormous crocodile, the rough patch, a bad day for Amos McGee. Lots of boy, we've got lots of readers here. Mother Bruce, Nuffle Bunny, Wolf the Bunny, all sorts of things. This is wonderful. And I know there are many more, but just some of the titles, Whole Whale. The Day the Crayons Quit, Evelyn Del Rey is Moving Away, Stella Luna, and yes, the person meant Woodwire Wings, Kirsten Larson, shout out to her. So I'm going to move on, but it's good for you to have some of these books in mind because even as you're creating your own books, you can think about, you can use these as mentor texts and as models and try to recreate some of the things that you see the writers, the authors doing in these books, how can you transfer those to your book? So I always say, as picture book writers, we read lots of picture books and they've said you should read a hundred picture books before you even begin to write your own. And a lot of people say, oh, I read picture books all the time. I'm a primary teacher or I read to my children or my grandchildren or the children who come to my home who for whom I'm a caregiver. But there's a difference between reading as a reader and reading as a writer. And we really want you to study and read these picture books as writers because that is really what is what's going to help you. So we're going to move on. So at this point, we're going to begin to actually look at some examples of books. So the first one I want to share is Look and Listen by Diane White and illustrated by Amy Schimler Safford. This book just came out this year, I feel like just very recently, a month or two ago. And the reason I wanted to start with this book is because this is an example of a book that doesn't have this big tension and this big conflict, but it really focuses on page turns. So part of it is, it says, who's that buzzing? Who's that buzzing? Listen, see, a fuzzy, yellow, busy, and then it's page turn to be. And then B is on the left side of the page. And then on the right side of the page, we have whose zings and words with feathers blurred, a small red throated. And then we turn the page and we have hummingbird. And then the next one starts. So this is really great. It's a great way to build tension with page turns. And also it's that rhyme predictability. So it's really a fun book to read with a young person and say, what do you think the person is seeing now? What do you think it's going to be? And so it's just a beautiful book and it's a, and page turns are used to keep you engaged because as you said earlier in the chat, it's about engagement. It's about interest. And it's about, again, with that tug of war interest, with the tug of war image, it's about what's pulling you along. And so you're very eager to get to the next page and be pulled along. The next book I want to share is written by my We Need Diverse Books mentor, Kelly Starling Lyons. And Kelly is such a beautiful writer. 
And this section is about suspense. So suspense is a way to create tension in a book. And sometimes we don't always think about that. We don't always think about, oh my goodness, tension, suspense in a picture book. We think of maybe suspense in other genres, but not necessarily picture books. But here's an example of suspense. One Saturday when she was out and daddy wasn't looking, I gently opened the door. It groaned softly like someone slowly waking up from a nap and I was in. This is a room that she's not supposed to be in. And in fact, even before that, there's a part in the book that even shows emotion and foreshadowing, which can also build tension. And I have some other examples of that, but I wanna read to you the part that comes before this. That day, mama closed her studio for good. Now, no one goes in that room. It just sits at the back of our house, quiet and lonely. So already there, we've got this emotion, we've got this foreshadowing, because when we've got a room that no one's entering, kids are gonna think, I wanna enter that room, I wanna know what's in that room. So here's the part in the story where the room is entered. So we've got that suspense going. This is a book I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And this is just a fun book by Ashley Spires who wrote it and illustrated it. And this is an example of what we think of as that typical tension building and the conflict and the action and escalation. So the angrier she gets, the faster she works. She smashes, and you even see the, the capital letters, she smashes pieces into shapes. She jams parts together. She pummels the little bits in. Her hands feel too big to work and her brain is too full of all the not right things. If only one thing would just work. Crunch. And this is the point where that finger gets smushed. The pain darts in her finger. It rushes up to her brain and she explodes. It is not her finest moment. I love that line. It is not her finest moment. No, it is not. And uh, she was already frustrated and then she hurts her finger. So we are not surprised that this is not her finest moment. So again, if you are really working on one of those stories where you are trying to build a frustration or someone getting angrier or getting more and more scared or whatever the emotion is that you're trying to heighten, doing something like this, really dragging it out or exploding the moment, this is a technique you can use. Even if we just look at those verbs there, smashes, jams, pummels, and the words that are in capital letters. So those are some things that you might want to think about. And then we have this one, there's a bear on my chair. And what I did for this one was I just took what was at the end of certain pages. So I didn't actually, this is not in succession, but on one page it ends with, but still I wish he was not there. And then the next page, why won't he go back to his lair? And then next, that stinky bear sat on my chair. And then we can see it escalating, but still I cannot stand this bear. So the stakes are raising. There's also that pacing of first, I, I wish he wasn't there. And then it's, why won't he go back to where he came from? And then we're calling him stinky. And then it's, I cannot stand. So we see that and it's gradual and particularly because there are words, as I said, before these words, this is just the last word at the end of each page. And also while we're talking about bear books, I want to give a shout out to Julie's book because that one is that book too with the bear in it and the escalation of are they going to get away from the bear? They see this bear and they're in between and they're behind. So over bear, under where? So that definitely is another book that, uh, that shows tension. 
And then this one is Hair Love by Matthew A. Cherry and Vashti Harrison. And this is one, too, where we, the rule of three, and I actually, it's the rule of three plus. I think there are about seven here. There are a lot of attempts to get this hair just right and the physical stakes, the stakes keep being raised. So again, I just had a few lines from this book. The first style was a big no way. The second was no better. Then daddy tried slicking my hair back into two cups. So it's, I just showed the three there, like this isn't trying, this dad is trying to get this little girl's hair. She is not pleased with it. And the expressions on her face, really dad kind of thing. So it's not this big sort of attention the way it was in the most magnificent thing, but there is this building because you're getting frustrated. It's, you're still not, ultimately the hairstyle is not a hairstyle that works. And so there are these pull attempts. And so again, rule of three is something we're very, very familiar with. Amy Wu and the Perfect Bow by Kat Zhang and Charlene Chua. This book is another great book where we see this, a child is trying something, really wants something to work like in the most magnificent thing and is just struggling. So again, we've got the rule of three, we've got those physical and emotional stakes. So this one is, Amy watches her mom make a perfect bow. She watches her dad make a perfect bow and her grandma too. They all try to teach her, but Amy's bow aren't the same. Maybe today won't be the day after all. Maybe Amy just can't make a perfect bow. And so we see she's watching. Mom has made a perfect one. Dad has made a perfect one. Grandma has made a perfect one too. So there's this sort of this building of if they can physically do it. I want to be able to physically do it. And this emotional attachment of being attached to mom and dad and grandma and the fact that they're all trying to teach her and help her. So as much as she wants to do it, you can imagine that there's also this sense of disappointment and not wanting to disappoint, but if you're not successful, you can feel not only disappointed in yourself, but that you're disappointing others. And so that's, that's a real feeling that, that kids have. So I want to use my books as examples too, because the two books that are currently published are quite different. Let's Dance is really more of a concept book. It's about dances from around the world and the diverse children who enjoy those dances. And even in this book, there is some tension. We go from dancing disco to ballet. And disco's got a lot of movement and ballet is, we're a bit more simmered down. It's a different type of dance. And, but yet, even in the ballet spread, we leap and we fly. Leap high, fly are the words. So even in that, where you're expecting ballet, up on toes, strike a pose is the first one, but then we're leaping and flying. And then also with the illustration, I will hold that up so you can see the background illustrations as well on the ballet spread. We see tension coming because we can see the day or the time of day actually is changing. And that's something that totally goes to the illustrator, Main Diaz did that. So as we look at this page, and I don't know how well you're going to be able to see it here, but we can see the background, those lighter colors, and then the colors are getting darker and you can see the stars and the moon. And then the last page is actually showing someone in bed and it's dark. So we're getting that foreshadowing at, of, the, of the time change. And we've also, as I said, we've got the action. We had 
disco the page before going into ballet. And then the other thing that I want to point out is there's also layering because I often, when I read this book, I ask students to picture who they think of when they think of someone who is a ballet dancer. And then I say, were you picturing anyone like the young people on these pages? And some of them will say, I was picturing someone like the girl in the background in the pink tutu because people are sometimes familiar with Misty Copeland, but they're not usually pic picturing someone wearing a hijab. They're not picturing this young person I love because we're not necessarily sure of the child's gender, the child could be non-binary. And so it's not typical. So again, that's something that the illustrator was able to do, even though admittedly I did make a request for certain things. I did say I want someone somewhere in the book to show that someone is Muslim. And then I also did a say, I actually want a boy in a tutu. And so when I got the book, I'm looking and I'm saying, I asked for a boy, but this isn't a, and then I'm like, wait, oh, this is even better. I'm not sure of the child's gender. And so that made me even happier. So again, these are things that can be done with words and also with illustration as adds a lot to a picture book. Those of you who are author illustrators, you're in such a wonderful position. Those of us who are authors only, we rely on you to really make our books magical. Now, Together We Ride is different in that it does tell a story. It tells a story in 30 words, <laughs> and it does have an actual arc because we have the girl here riding along and then she falls and she cries and her dad soothes her. And then there's this point where she has to decide, is she going to get back up on the bike? Is she going to say, I'm going to keep at it. I want to really get this thing. Is she going to say, forget this. I'm done. I never am going to learn how to ride a bike and I don't care. Or maybe it'll be something in between where she says, I've had enough for today, but maybe tomorrow I'll come back and try again. And so this book, I think, does have the page turns because first of all, when a child is learning how to ride a bike, that at some point, everything is not going to go smoothly. So it keeps you wanting to turn the pages to see, is she gonna, how is she doing with the ride? How is she moving along? And then those emotional stakes, particularly when she falls and gets hurt. And I will show those two pages here where we have slip, slide, tossed aside. So that's where the fall happens. And then the next page, dad gives her a hug. And then this is the page I want to show. Tears dried, decide. She's looking at the bike. She's deciding if she's going to get back on. And also I will point out, even though that could be a different workshop, is agency. How we always talk about have the young person have agency in the story. And that's really a perfect example because her dad is not pushing her to get back on the bike. He's not saying often when children are upset, our instinct is to help them and to encourage them. Oh, come on, get back on the bike. Oh, come on. But this is, she gets to decide. And so it's the ultimate agency moment. It also reminds me a bit as I'm talking of that wonderful book, The Rabbit Listened, where everyone is trying to fix someone's problems and it's the rabbit who really listens and then the issue can be resolved and the character sort of figures things out. So those are just some side notes to think of. But again, this is really about page turns and emotional stakes for this book. One of the things to think about is what is happening in the story on a physical level and what is also happening on an emotional level so that we can, we have physical things going on. Like even in Together We Ride, as I just said, there's the physical act 
of learning how to ride a bike, which is obviously a physical activity. But then there's this emotion of falling and getting hurt and being connected to an adult and having that adult support and soothe you, but not rush you along or make you do something you're not ready for. I also had talked about in Amy Wu and the Perfect Bow, how there's this physical act of making the bow, but this is such an emotional connection for her to do this with her family and to be involved in this family tradition that is pulling at her and pulls at the reader because we want her to be successful. We want her to be able to make the perfect bow. We want the little girl and together we ride to be successful and learn how to ride a bike. So I want to show, and I want to see, I hope I don't mess things up here. I'm realizing I probably should have tried this too, but I want to see if I am able to, you're probably seeing more than you're seeing all my tabs, but hopefully you're able to see, at least shut this out. Hopefully you're able to at least see this. So the first thing I want to point out is we have version 20 versus version 36. So you can do the math and you can see that there were 16 versions in between. And so I show this as well to students because they think one and done. And so we talk about the different versions and how revision is real work. And of course, I, you don't expect students to have 20 versions of something, but you do want them to have three and four, at least. You, we want them to go through and revise. So I'm going to read this to you, and you can see I was really working to, in the second version that you'll see, even though it's 16 away, I was really working on the emotional tension. So in this one, just as I was about to search the playground, Nana called. There's a storm brewing. Let's find cover before it bubbles up and overflows onto us. But I haven't found anything for mommy. You don't need to, sugar, but I want to. So we do feel that there, we feel a sense of tension there. But in this version, before long, cotton candy clouds fill the dark sky. I have to find something quickly. I run as if I'm being chased in a game of tag. That's when I see it. Whenever mommy and I pick one, we make a wish together. I'll bring it to mommy. We can wish for her to come home. Nana, look what I found. No! What if mommy's memories of me blow away too? So you can see if we weren't in a webinar, I would actually have you unmute and respond. I'm not going to have you necessarily write in the chat at this point, but you can see the difference. And in this first version, we know that there's a mommy and that this child is looking for something for mommy. But in the second version, the emotional stakes are raised because we have, we actually have a sense that this girl did shared something very special with mommy. There's something that they used to do together and she wants to bring this to her. And then she gets it and then it blows away. And she's concerned about what if her mother doesn't remember her? What if mommy's memories of her blow away? And that is really for a child, for any of us, that is really the emotion. Obviously at this point we're pulled in, we want to know what's going on. This got blown away. Is she going to get another one? We've also got this storm coming. So all of those, all of those things we are looking at. There was actually what I was remembering as I was presenting. So this is a good time to show it because I've shown all the books and I've also shown my own writing in process. So I wanted to, for some reason, I skipped this slide. And this is a slide that I had gotten from Karen Boss's presentation. And as you can see, tension can be compared to an electrical current that runs through a story. The weaker the current, the less a story transmits to an audience. The greater the current, the greater the involvement of an audience. So I hope that in the revision I just showed you, you can see that the current 
was greater in version 36 than in version than in version 20. So we are going to move along now past all the slides that you've seen, but it's a good reminder for you to remember the different books and the different ways to create tension. But I do have them all on a slide here. And so again, just to review some of the things we talked about, actually, I'm not even going to read them to you because you can read them to yourselves. And, but I wanted you just to see them laid out here as you've seen them individually or two or three at a time mentioned in the different books. So there are a number of ways to increase tension. So you now are going to have the opportunity to create some tension. And so that's why it asks for you to have a piece of writing. And I want to give you an opportunity, just a few minutes. I know this is a webinar and some people are probably multitasking. If this were a different situation, I would probably give you minimum 10, if not 15 minutes to try something out, but it'll probably be closer to about three minutes, just because again, I want to be cognizant of the fact that some people really are going to do this activity and tune in and some are not. And so I just, I want to be respectful of that. So I think about three minutes ish is will give those of you who want to have some time to try to try. So please take out your piece of writing and think about if you want to the type of tension that you'd like to add. So you may begin now. And I will actually mute myself just so there's nothing here that distracts you. And I am looking at the clock here and we'll come back in about three minutes. Okay, I appreciate you, those of you who participated in that activity. I know it wasn't a lot of time, so you probably couldn't get much done, but hopefully you were able to accomplish something, even if it was changing a word or a sentence or figuring out a page turn or having some ideas for how you might add emotional tension. So if you would write in the chat, I'm just curious to know if you can share either any thoughts about how the activity worked for you or what techniques you used. I'd just like to see what people were working on. Rule of three and repetition. Zooming in to slow down on a moment. Yep, noted places where you need to increase tension. That's great. Maybe you didn't have time in three minutes to actually increase the tension, but even noticing where you can do it is great. And Ashley, I saw a shout out to Ashley Murray, my We Need Diverse Books mentee. She's here and said she's working on emotional tension, which is great. CK as well added emotion. That's wonderful. So just people are working on different things, word choice and pacing and including frustration level to build tension. So again, there are so many options. There are so many ways of doing this. You get to decide, but I do see a lot of people using emotional tension because we often connect with emotion. I tend to think most stories are their heart stories or their humor stories. Of course, there can be all sorts of stories, but I feel that if you are working on, if it's emotion, how can you increase that emotion? And if it's humorous, how can you go over the top humorous? I know Tara Lazar talks, uh, talks about that as well. Yes, Marilyn, my CP talking about building up tension with good verbs. Absolutely. Marilyn's one of the wordsmiths in our group. So lots of different things that people are working on. And I appreciate you sharing those thoughts with me and with the rest of the group as well. At this time, I want to there, I want to share my information. I am going to give you time to ask questions. I always want to make sure there's more time than more than enough time for questions, but I did want to share how you can connect with me. And actually before questions, there are a couple of other things that, that I will share, but I want to leave this, I'll leave this slide up in case, and most looking at the names in the chat, most of you are connected with me anyway, which is great. 
But in the event that you're not, this is the opportunity. I will say I do my best to keep my website updated so you can pretty much keep in touch with what's going on there. Twitter is where I'm most active. I do have a Facebook author page. I would say that's sort of the next place. And Instagram, I'm just not super active. I try to post things there, but I'm just not as active there. I do, one of the things I will share, and I may put it in the chat, this is what I was going to say, or possibly it will just go in the email with the replay, is I do actually have some book lists. I think I created the book list, if not last year, between 2020 and 2021, and some of the books are older and I don't have all of the current books. But I can share that with you. And then one or two, or even, they're not even my book list. They're from School Library Journal. I also, if you're not familiar with Debbie Ridpath Ohi and you're working on page turns, I know most of you probably know this, but some of the newer writers may not. The, the dummy to create page turns, so you see the 32 page layout that I can include a link for that. So that's, those are just some resources that I'm happy to include. There's also an article, some of you may subscribe to Jane Friedman's newsletter. And there's, she has an article about tension. Laura Lavoie has a post that she did as well, I believe. So I can, I'll try to, when I'll stop sharing momentarily, and then when I'm back, <clears throat> excuse me, in the other format, I can try to put some things in the chat and Kelly might even be able to pull them then. And if not, I can, I can email them later. Yeah. So I did have, yeah, I was going to say more about layering or foreshadowing or whatever, but if someone has questions, I can take those because perhaps it was clear enough. So I am going to stop the sharing at this point that just this, this last slide I was going to share, which I believe simply says, thank you. So I did want to thank all of you for coming. As I said, it's, it's a summer day. It's tough to, in the afternoon, necessarily come to a presentation like this. So I definitely wanted to be sure I welcome your questions, which we'll get to. And I wanted to thank you. So thank you so much. Hey, thank Yay. you. Wow. That was fantastic. I don't think we've ever had a webinar dedicated just to tension before. And what's in, what was interesting to me is we've had webinars on pacing and so on. And, but pacing is one way of creating tension, but not the only way. And so I really appreciate you taking this deep dive into a topic that really can be make it or break it in terms of getting a book acquired. And I hope you're seeing all the love in the chat. Somebody, someone said, already have a plan to tackle a story I set aside. Yes, good. Great. Thank you all. Jazz to put your suggestions to work. That's what we like to hear. Okay. Here's a great question. Mary Jo asks, do you have any advice on creating opening lines that will set up tension? That would probably be another workshop. <laughs> I don't have, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't have anything specific. I think the best way is to read books and see the different types of opening lines. We do talk about at the beginning of a book, you can set up so that we, I think making the characters want clear and what the possible conflict might be. I think those, any language that you're using to set that up, that's going to make us interested in the book. So I think just, and also I find particularly with beginnings and endings, I usually come up with four or five different options because I'm really trying to get the best one. And sometimes I know in our critique group, we may just share beginnings or just endings just because we're trying to get the right one. So I don't have a 
anything more specific than that? I just wanted, because I have this book right here, this is one I just got out of the library. This it's called Make Meatballs Sing. Oh. And I, this is a picture book biography, The Life and Art of Corita Kent. And it has one of the most awesome opening lines I've seen in a long time. And I think it fits. When Frances Elizabeth Kent was a child in Hollywood, California, she discovered a hole in the hedge behind her house. Wow. And you want to, for so much information about the character is packed in there. Her name, where she grew up. But we just have to know what this hole in the hedge, what, where did that lead to? What Absolutely. happened then? It shows in the way she's looking at it, it shows here's a very curious child. And we know that hole, right? Before you even turn the page, we know that hole is not going to go unexamined. And I don't know, I, maybe that's a little bit of foreshadowing with what you talked about, but it's, I like the question though, because it's important, I think, to be thinking about tension right from the opening line, not just after the catalyst. And I think a lot of us think of it that way. Once you get to the catalyst, then you have to escalate. But really, you want to be putting those building blocks be even before, like right from the very beginning. Dina asks, is it possible to create too much tension so that it doesn't feel believable? Or do you think kids love over-the-top tension? That's a good question. Yeah, again, I think it depends on the book. It also depends on the child, right? Like some people love silly slapstick humor and some people don't. So if your goal is to make something over the top funny or over the top punny or anything like that, and you have fun with it and you do it successfully, go for it. You can always trim back. It's better sometimes in a book to have a little more, notice I didn't say a lot more, but to have a little more and then you can trim back and that's where your critique partners will help you too. If they think you've overdone something, they will let you know, but generally people actually like it when you take that additional step. Again, if you, with the most magnificent thing, that actually seems a bit over the top and the capital letters and the this and the that, but it actually works. So I think you just have to try it and then trim back if you and other feedback you're getting suggests that it's too much. Um, and I, Valerie, I would imagine that being a teacher and having read lots and lots of books to kids that you can tell where for your own writing, like where to turn it on more and where to pull back a little bit. Right. Okay. Let's see. Can, Tara asks, can, should lyrical books have tension? And I think maybe by lyrical, we're also talking quiet. Right. Again, it depends on what you're trying to do in the book. I am not going to say every single book has to have tension. I think a few things to keep in mind are, one, there are quiet books and there are books that, that are published and books that we love that are not highly filled tension books. So I think one thing is to think about ways, what is tension? Like the first book I shared, look and listen, that book is not what we think of when we think of tension, but because if we look at tension as what keeps us interested and what pulls us along, it, it, there is tension there because of the way the page turns are placed that you don't find out the ending word until you turn the page. And there's also, as I said, that rhyming predictability. And Let's Dance, in all honesty, it doesn't have a story arc. I don't, it's not a book that typically would be an example of tension, 
but because I'm doing the workshop and I want to get my books in there, I can find the tension in it. I'm close to the book. I know the book. And the examples I gave are legitimate examples that this push pull of the different types of dances. And we have one where we're up and then one that's supposed to calm us down. And it does because we're just striking a pose. And then next we're leaping. And then what the illustrator did with the tension of we see it going from sort of twilight to nightlight. So it's just a matter of thinking about what would, what is going to keep someone interested. I think if you keep at the forefront of your mind, what is going to get someone interested in my story? What is going to make someone want to read this story again and again? Then I think you've been successful. The other thing I will say is we know this is a super competitive market and agents and editors have lots of choices. That said, agents are constantly taking on new clients. We see the announcements. Editors are constantly editing books. So the possibility is there, but often for a first book or a beginning writer, it can be more challenging to publish a quieter book, a book that may not have as much marketability or commercial pull, something like that. So that's just something to keep in mind and to be aware of, but that shouldn't be at the forefront of your writing. As I said, keep at the forefront of your writing. How do I make this book the best book I can? And how do I make it interesting? That What are the interesting parts of it? What are the things I can do with maybe adding emotion or thinking about a page turn or something with the pacing or escalating or anything like that. And that's really, if you keep your mind focused there, I think you'll come up with ways to write the best book. Yeah. And I'm also thinking, particularly with respect to Let's Dance, rhyme as a tool for writing has tension built right into it because you especially, this is why they say if you're using predictable rhyme, it doesn't work as well. But if you are using interesting rhymes and you're applying it to something that the kids don't already know about, say the names of the types of different dances, that's in and of itself tension. So if you have a lyrical book, think about how the words and the order and the rhythm and all of that can be used to create tension as well. So I think you do that wonderfully in your rhyming books. Can art notes be used to build tension through illustrations or does there need to be a balance between text and illustration? I think that's translating to how do you leave room for the illustrations to help with the tension? If you're yeah. not only. Again, I think if you write the best story you can write and the illustrator will fill in. I had no notes about build up that the scene that shows that we go from day into twilight to night. The last page was fall asleep counting sheep. So that would clearly be a nighttime scene, but there was no indication from my part that the background colors should change to show that we're going tonight. So is that something Maine, the illustrator came up with on her own? Is that something the editor Jess gave her the idea for? I don't know, because I think as most of, there is not, there are always exceptions, but for the most part, and certainly in my experience with my books, there's no direct communication with the illustrator. It's done, the editor communicates between the two of us. I don't think that's something you would need to worry about unless, if you're the author illustrator, perhaps, yes, but I don't think you need to worry so much about the illustrations. Again, if you write the best story and the tension is already in it, the illustrator will be able to run with that and the illustrations will be magnificent. And if you have in the case of Overbear Underwear, I did allow quite a bit of the humor and the story to be told in the illustrations. And I did have to indicate that with art notes but they weren't prescriptive in terms of how the illustrator was going to accomplish said task. And it works out more beautifully, as Valerie said, than you can even imagine. So it's not as if you're not 
creating the tension you are and you have it in your head and you're just giving that space for the illustrator then to step in and whether it's outrageous or heartwarming or whatever, you're giving them the opportunity to enrich those layers. Hey, while we're on the subject of art notes, when you showed your example, you had your art notes in a different color and asking, is this a new way to put them in? I've always been told to have them on their own line and write justified. Go ahead. Depends. Probably the editor will tell you, actually, it was my agent. First of all, I, when I was querying and so forth, I always used brackets and I then used italics for, for the illustrator note. With my agent, James says he likes to put them in blue because he likes to have them be a different color. I know with my early reader series with Scholastic that comes out next year, Rainbow Days, that editor likes for me just to use parentheses and still in black, and then I, I italicize it. So I think it depends. It just... Again, those are the kind, that's one of the questions. It's not going to keep you from getting agented or working with an editor. Someone will just tell you their preference, but as long as you have somehow shown that it's an illustration note, and I think, again, if you've used brackets or parentheses, you can use a different color or not. You can use italics or not. I think they'll be, they'll know that it's an illustrator note. Yeah, perfect. Yes, I don't, I am unaware of any like known, this is the way, this is the format for art notes. So just make sure they're clear and readable and differentiated. Lena is asking here, do you have, you inspired me to revise all my manuscripts. <laughs> That's good. Any tips on what is in fashion in the industry now? Follow it or not? Yeah, I'm not the one to really respond to that. Maybe an agent or editor could tell you, but I don't feel equipped to respond to that. Sorry. Yeah. What about you? So what are you working on lately? Things we know about your upcoming books. What else are you working on and how are you stretching yourself these days? Sure. So I have three projects that I'm hoping to accomplish this summer. I'm confident I will accomplish two of them because I've already accomplished one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the third one, I'm kind of like the first one, I will admit I'm jumping the gun a bit. I mentioned that I have an early reader series coming out with Scholastic next year. So there are three books in the series, Rainbow Days. I am hoping, and the editor has expressed as well, that she'd like to see it as a long running series. But because this is a business, of course, it will depend on sales. But because I've been, I haven't written any books since I wrote those, which was in, I wrote the first one in 2020. And then when it sold, I must have written the others sometime in 2021. So I feel I've been out of it. And so I felt I needed to get back into that. So even though I don't know if they'll sell, fortunately, I, they didn't take me a lot of time to write. So I was okay to take the time doing that. So I've written the next three in the series sending positive vibes out that they're going to sell. So that was first on my list. So I've done that, written books four, five, and six. And then I am currently working on a picture book biography. I have one that I've written that I'm out on submission with now. <gasps> Fingers crossed, we'll see. And this one actually is different because I want it to be very sparse text, sparse for a picture book bio, which is, it'll probably be around 500-ish words, which is not sparse, but for most bio biography it is, yeah. It is. So I'm working on that at the very beginning stages. And then I wrote an early reader chapter book at the beginning of the year. And I have an idea for a series and I workshopped it one chapter at a time with my picture book critique group. And they were so wonderful. 
And then I got feedback from James shortly before Together We Ride was coming out. So I really didn't have time to go back and revise because that's a bigger project. That's eight chapters. So it's like eight chapters. It's like revising eight picture books. And then the end of the school year comes. So I'm really hoping to get to that, but I've just been so darn busy and I need like a chunk of time. I need to have four or five days of uninterrupted time where I can really just work on it. And I think there's a week in August maybe before I go back to school where I have that and I'm trying to preserve it. So we'll see if I'm able to get that done. I may just need that week to rest and just decompress because again, it's just, it's been a very busy summer. If you've been following me on social, I've been two weekends. I was away one doing an event in Brooklyn, getting an, an award from the National Education Association in Chicago. And then last week I was at Highlights as a faculty member at their summer camp and fiction workshop, which was amazing. I'm doing this today. Tomorrow I'm at Nerd Camp doing presentation. And in three weeks, I'm off to Denver for the Margins Conference. I'm presenting there, also presenting. We'll have to see if we can get together. Oh, great. That would be awesome. That would be great. And I'm also doing from Denver, I'll be doing a virtual presentation for the SCBWI Summer Conference. So a lot of my writing has been presentations and such. Yeah, I guess we're lucky that we got to have you here, given oh, how tight how tight your schedule, but I feel you. I know how it can get really, and it's all great. It's all great. But yeah, you sometimes have to swing the pendulum back in the other direction. We did have someone say that they wish you would write a YA novel. So you better, you should get on that pretty quickly too. Yeah, I don't know. I can see perhaps middle grade in my future, maybe next year or the following year. That's, but YA, I don't know. I don't know if I have the voice for YA, but if I do middle grade, I'm inching up picture book, early reader, early chapter book. If that can get published, that will then inspire me to do middle grade. And then who knows? It's possible if I decide I want to do it and I really study the genre, it's absolutely possible. We'll see. Yes. Anything is possible. Absolutely. <laughs> In the world of picture books, anything is possible. That's all very exciting and inspiring. And I'm wishing you the best of luck in all of those projects. And how about your, it, it doesn't even have to be your best or top piece of advice, because I think that puts undue pressure on people, but like just given the vibe today and what we talked about, what is a takeaway that you want people to walk away from this webinar with? Oh, from this particular webinar, I think it be anything, it doesn't have to be related to tension just today. What is I your, I think it actually, what I would say does relate to the webinar and just writing in general is enjoy it. Make, write the stories that you want to write, make them the best that you can make them. And if you're enjoying it, if you aren't currently agented or published or so forth, it doesn't matter because you're enjoying and continuing to learn the process. And at some point it can and will happen. There are people who have been querying for years and years, and then eventually it happens. So just keep at it. Don't give up. Don't despair. And I also, I want people to know, sometimes people think, oh, you're published or this person's published. You have it easy. You really don't. And to Julie, I'm out on submission and there are rejections in that process. And people will give you feedback about your writing that isn't always encouraging, but you have to just shake it off. And the more you write, and this is where 12 by 12 comes in, if something, maybe there is a manuscript that your agent even loves and is champion, champ, championing, and for some reason, it's just not sitting right, maybe with the group of editors or in terms of the market. But if you have other manuscripts, then you can go out with something else. So that's why you always want to 
keep writing so that you have a lot of work. And believe me, picture books are my first love, but sometimes a way of continuing to grow or of keeping the tension there for yourself and keeping yourself interested is to explore other genres as well. So like for the person who said to me, YA, maybe that's something you want to do or early readers or middle grade. So thinking about not only picture books, but what else might you have an interest in or the types of picture books, like the two that are currently published of mine are sparse rhyming text. But as I said, I also write longer books. You saw a section of one with the story about Karima. I also write picture book biographies. So even within the picture book genre, what are the different ways you can flex your muscles and your writing brain and just keep moving for yourself and keep that tension going for you? Because when we are a little tense, that's when we can learn and grow. Yes. Yes. You're so right. Our own tension can be propulsive yeah. as well. So allow that frustration to be something that keeps you moving. And I love that you shared how many queries, how many rejections you got starting off, because it really isn't easy for anybody, no matter what stage they're in. This is a difficult business. It's a highly rewarding business, yeah. but it is not easy or for the faint of heart. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. Shake yeah. it so just keep at it. And it's whoever put in the request for the YA made me think what might be a fun little summer game. Sometimes just getting you jarred out of your own myopic zone of what you're writing. I was like, what if we did the secret Santa type thing? Only instead of gifts, the pairs give each other book ideas. <laughs> so like you get this character and this setting and this conflict and you have to write something. Or you could do this with your critique partners too. I sometimes find that if you get out of the seriousness of this is my manuscript that I need to work on and fix and make, and you just do something t really that's much more out of the right side of your brain or you're just like, yes, we will get a, we will have a special badge. <laughs> if we do this challenge, those who complete it, but both par partners have to complete it in order for the badge to be given. So if you sign up, you have to know that if you don't do your part, you're going to make it so that your partner can't get a badge either. But anyway, back to the ranch here. Thank you so much, Valerie, for your amazing presentation and your generosity of your knowledge and your time. I hope things do calm down a bit for you so that you have time to keep getting those amazing books out into the world and because we want more. And thanks to, from me to everybody who came today. I know it's an afternoon in the middle of the summer, but it was definitely worth it. And so everybody keep writing, keep submitting, keep going. That's it for today. Thank you all for being here. And thank you for your kind comments in the chat. I've been reading them and I really appreciate them. Thank you so much and make those stories fabulous. I know you will. Okay. Bye everybody. Bye.